gee whiz, I was going to do all kinds of thank yous, but Roland kind of messed that up for me. And I was going to kind of talk about all kinds of crazy things with trees and shrubs and bushes and vines. Uh, and then Greg kind of ruined that for me. You'll see later on I was going to talk a little bit about the Food Safety Modernization Act. Somebody else ruined that for me. But why don't I talk about that right there? I love this place. This is a beautiful, 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 gorgeous planet. Strangest planet I've ever been on, but it's a beautiful planet. <laughs> this planet has been here for what, between 6,000 and 2 billion, 3 billion years? <laughs> Depending on which books you read, it doesn't matter really how old it's been here. It's been here, and it's been doing just fine, just the way it is, without too much meddling, no fossil fuels, no fertilizers, you know, chemicals, sprays, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, no plowing, none of that kind of stuff. It's been doing just fine. It's been playing a, a real simple playbook. It has only a handful of species, only several hundred thousand species worldwide, and it all works together really, really fine to create the conditions for a good, healthy life. This continent right here was a whole range of things from, from tundra, ice fields, tundra, to the taiga, uh, the boreal forests, the, uh, the northern spruce fir, all the different chaparral, California floristic zones, the prairies, the savannas, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place this was. Teeming with life. All taking care of itself for zero dollar costs. All happening with no external labor inputs. It all kind of took care of itself. Then a mere couple hundred years ago, Europeans showed up and they took what was formerly a full, complete, three-dimensional, perennial ecosystem and they turned it into agriculture. We had this idea of what agriculture was and we imposed it on the planet. This is a, a graphic from the USDA that uh, shows the agricultural land in the USA. Take a look at that. Almost 50% of the United States of America is plowed farmland that used to be an ecosystem. It used to take carbon out of the atmosphere. It used to purify the water. It used to be home and habitat for all kinds of wildlife. It used to produce food, fuels, medicines, and fibers at no cost, running only on solar energy. So we cut it all down, we plow it all up, we burn it. Uh, the other part, all of the red, the yellow, and the green in this picture right here is agricultural land. 50% of it is plowed ground. The other 50% of it is um, uh, rangeland, grassland, and grazing. When, when you plow the ground, when you plow the ground, you're oxidizing the organic matter, you're releasing carbon directly into the atmosphere. You're creating all this dust, your resource, your, your, your crop production resource, the soil itself is blowing away in the wind. This guy right here actually is an award-winning certified organic farmer that two different years in a row he got top corn yields in the state of Wisconsin two years in a row. I won't tell you who he is. And here he is, he's working his buns off. He knows that we have, what, six, seven, eight billion people on this planet. And the UN says that we have to double the world's food supply in 40 short years just to break even. Break even means that 80% of the human race goes to bed hungry every single night. That's not right. By sticking with our concept of what we think agriculture is and agriculture should be, by plowing up more ground, cutting down more forests to plow up more soil, plowing up more grasslands, to plow up more soil, we're destroying the actual ecology of the planet for a handful of seeds. That won't work. It can't work. For a handful of hard, dry seeds. Now, 90% of the food that humanity eats comes from annual plants. These are plants that you put the seeds in the ground, they grow really fast, they produce a, a prodigious amount of seeds that's hard and dry and it stores for a long period of time. That's good because it gives us something to protect. So you have standing militaries and security forces and, and transportation security administrations and all that. That's good for the economy. But it causes all kinds of problems for a couple of reasons. One is we are not either created, adapted, or evolved to digest this stuff. We are lacking two different organs. One is called a crop and one is called a gizzard, of which we have neither. Okay? We are not designed to eat these annual grains and legumes. Don't do this to me. <laughs> do that. All right, there we go. 
and beans. This picture right here is especially significant to me. Um, I oftentimes am driving around and I see like, oh, state historical marker. So I pull over and I read what this one was. Uh, this is just west of Athens, Ohio. And during the, um, uh, I guess, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who remembers the Jefferson administration? So, <laughs> they, sent, they sent survey teams west into the Western Reserve. And every six miles, you would stop and you would record what you saw. You'd, you'd list all the animals, all the plants, and what was around you. The previous stop, they'd just come out of the foothills of the Appalachians. The previous stop, they described um, old growth American chestnut, eight foot diameter trunks that basically went halfway to the moon. The understory shrubs were four foot diameter sugar maples, 60 feet to the first branch. Their biggest concern was the fact that there wasn't any grass and their horses were going hungry and if they didn't hurry up and find grass, they'd have to turn around and go back with their heads between their, uh, heads between their tails? <laughs> but they came out to this opening. All of a sudden, the forest opened up and there was this big opening and they described approximately six gigantic oak trees per acre. And up in the oak trees were the you know, mountain lions kind of hanging lazy on the branches with the tails flipping this way. There's deer dripping off the branches and turkeys all over the place. There were bison, there were black bear and grizzly bear. There were herds of elk, there were herds of deer. There were uh, uh, fowl all over the ground, nesting birds everywhere. The thing that they remarked most is that the grass was over the tops of the heads of their horses. The abundance that they described in the savanna biome was part of what brought settlers down into this part of down, down the Ohio Valley. Now they're going to set up camp in the beautiful, rich soil of the Ohio Valley. So they cut everything down, plowed it all up, burned what they couldn't plow up to plant oats. What was there? What an amazing, abundant resource was there. The fish that were in the creek, they would catch the fish out of the creek with a pitchfork and throw them into hay wagons. Hello! What a phenomenally abundant planet we had. Then the soil was so rich, so incredibly rich, from hundreds of thousands of years of organic matter, plants and animals living and dying and pooping and peeing and all that kind of stuff, that stored so much water that when you tried to plow the ground and plant corn in the spring, it was too wet. So you had to dig ditches to drain all the water away. So our agriculture, our agriculture by nature goes into an intact ecosystem destroys it, exposes the bare soil, drains the water away so we can grow a few hard seeds that cause heart attacks, diabetes, and obesity. And we're not even designed to digest them. Then it rains. Now there's no absorptive capacity on our soil. That's okay, we have the USDA best management practices, <laughs> soil conservation. We have windbreaks and grassy water strips and contour farming. It's not enough, folks. It's not enough. The way we're doing agriculture is not working. This happens to be my uh, state senator's office, and he, he uh, is of, of a political party that doesn't believe that anybody should get any handouts, because you should pick yourself up by the bootstraps. But he got cost year funding for wild pollinator habitat, <laughs> his grassy water strips, his hinking bottom drains, and all that kind of stuff. And the next picture is in the downlands, in the lowlands. After it comes off the hill, it goes roaring, look to the back. It goes roaring across the bottoms. He got cost sharing for riparian buffer strips, uh, grassy, grassy waterways, that's where his wild pollinator habitat is. It's not good enough. So then what happens when he loses his crop to all these floods? He gets the crop insurance. It's not a direct payment for farmers. Agriculture is not subsidized. This is insurance, right? Sure. Go back. That's a lousy picture, isn't it? It should, it should be more focused. The thing is, most of these annual crops in the USA, 70% 70, 70 of all the corn and beans in this country go to feed animals. If you're thinking about that, 70% of 95 million acres of corn goes to feed a cow. And it takes about 10 pounds of grain to make one pound of beef. And so I side with the vegans that say it is, a, it is an environmental crime. It is an environmental crime to eat grain-fed livestock. Unless, of course, they're adapted to it so birds don't come. For cows to eat corn and beans is an environmental crime. It takes 10, 10 times the amount of food. We could feed 10 times that many people and give them diabetes and heart attacks. <laughs> then, that's, so that's 70% of the corn and beans goes to feed animals. The other 20, 20 go to make fuel for our cars. Now wait a minute, what are they telling us about we're short on food and we got to feed the human race? Oh, you can't feed the human race with, you know, organic, blah, blah, blah. Like, well, you know, 
Stop doing this, folks. Don't eat a cow that ate stuff that a cow is not supposed to eat. Don't put this stuff in your car if somebody wants somebody else to eat it. This is an environmental crime. And how many of you are like just living the life of life and everything's fine, the world is just perfect, there's no problems anywhere, right? You know, why on earth do we have to get up every single day and slave our lives away to barely get by? It's, it's a rigged system, so let's stop participating, okay? Let's just stop participating. So, so I had to write a book, Restoration and Agriculture. I, I wrote the book just as much to get the doggone thing off my chest because I was getting sick and tired of explaining to people what I was doing. Uh, you know, like, that's not an orchard, you're not doing it right. Great. You're not crazy properly. Jack, Greg Judy would pay me for that. <laughs> I was doing everything not by the book. If there's something that I was told that I shouldn't do, I'd go and try it just to see why. <laughs> and then if there's something that, that I shouldn't do, it's like, well, maybe I should just to see why not. And, and then I'm also I'm like reading all these books and going to these workshops, and I wonder, it's like, why on earth is it all these workshops, all these books tell me only one of two things? How do I kill the stuff that wants to stay alive? And how do I keep the stuff alive that wants to die? <laughs> so this, this cosmic dissonance would drive me nuts. And, and then I'm driving down the side of the road, and I'm looking at a brush at the side of the road. It's like, wait a minute, look at the brush on the side of the road. What is it? Is this tree over that bush over that vine over this cane over the grass and the mushrooms and the fungus and these animals? And nobody did a thing to it except abuse it with a snowplow and herbicide and a big huge eater that goes on the side of the road. <laughs> So I chose the title Restoration Agriculture because this planet is in eco ecological trouble. It's in serious trouble. The ecological systems of this planet are in free fall. We need an absolute total, 100% boots on the ground, revegetating this planet. Not blogging about it, not getting more friends on Facebook, but putting roots in the ground for real people. We need ecological restoration. And what we can't do is listen to people who say, oh, you have a choice. It's either the economy or the environment. It's like, no, we don't. That's a, that's, that's, that's a BS equation. <laughs> that's a BS, BS argument, okay? We need to do restoration while simultaneously doing agriculture. What we need to do is design an agriculture that imitates natural ecosystems with tall trees, medium-sized trees, shrubs, vines, canes, grasses, fungi decomposing the whole thing in animals. That's how the planet has rolled for as long as it's been around. Natural ecosystem design farms that we plant mechanically, we maintain mechanically, we harvest mechanically. If you guys aren't comfortable with the fact that we eat from machines, go hungry, okay? We live in a very large system. There are seven, eight, ten billion people that we have to feed. We've got to do it at scale. No more fooling around. And I use this word permaculture because a long time ago I became trained as a permaculture designer. And uh, there's this guy called Bill Mollison who invented the word and invented the whole you know, methodology of permaculture. And it's his signature that's on my diploma. <clears throat> so I kind of I give the guy a little credit for thinking about permaculture more than most people have. And when I was taught permaculture, he taught me that it was permanent agriculture. <clears throat> so I've become frustrated in recent years, that's why I wrote this book, with the permaculture movement, that I had seen that the permaculture movement had drifted into triviality. Let's make a 16 brick rocket stove and solve all the problems in the world. You know, let's, let's make a mud oven in Vermont where it rains 100 inches a year and dissolves the mud. Let's do things out of context. Let's, let's do stupid designs like a rain barrel, a 50 gallon rain barrel trying to catch 1,500 gallons of water coming off the roof of your house. That's not a real design. Those of you who are, are certified permaculture designers, I'm calling you out. It's time to get real, okay? Time to stop being trivial, and it's time to really start solving the world's problems. We're gonna produce the food, the fuel, the medicines, and the fibers that human beings need. They're staple food crops in permaculture systems, and we can't do that in a, in a postage stamp of our backyard. We're gonna do a postage stamp of our backyard, and the neighborhood, and the community, and in the, and in the uh, rural areas, we have to permaculture the whole entire planet. For real, no joke. <laughs> One of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a lot of fun, too. <laughs> and uh, we actually, believe it or not, <laughs> I, I grew up in a family that was um, half 
alcoholics went to AA meetings, and the other half were born again Amway salesmen. <laughs> and so I, I got a lot of that rap. It's like, man, what a great country, what a great country. And it really is, because what you can do is once a year take a family vacation. When you take a family vacation, go to Washington, D.C., it doesn't matter, you know, um, whether you go at the high-end hotels, you take a bus or a plane or drive or whatever. Go to Washington, D.C. once a year. A couple weeks before you go, um, call your senators and congressmen's office and set up appointments. And what you do is you get your suit and your you know, pretty dresses on, you walk in, you make a couple of white papers, and you go in and you sit down, you have your 10 to 15 minutes talking with staffers, and you explain to them who you are and what you're doing. And then they're going to ask you, oh, well, what would you like? And it's like, we don't want anything from you. We want you to figure out what we're doing and keep up with us. Because this is where we're going and this is what we're doing and you better catch up. Thank you very much for your time. And then now you're in the building, you made it through security, don't just visit your senators. <laughs> you, go, you go into the office and you look at the business cards, you look at the top business card and you say, oh yeah, I uh, have a one o'clock appointment with Terrence Clary. Oh, oh, I don't see you. Know, maybe we can schedule something. I want to talk about agriculture. I want to talk sustainable agriculture. I want to talk permaculture. I want to talk restoration agriculture. You'll get another meeting. You just walk the halls, walk the halls, walk the halls. <laughs> have a hoot. Then you go to all the hotels and have a great time, eat some good food, and learn about all the history of this country. They need to know what we're doing. We have answers that they're ignoring. They're ignoring us because we haven't stuck together as a force and as a power. What was the line you were saying? A lot of littles make a big. That's the point. Let's overwhelm them with littles. Let's keep pouring mice into the halls of Congress until they can't get rid of us. <laughs> and then when we go home, let's put roots in the ground. Now there's a particular procedure, if you do things on your farm, it'll be easier to, to pull this off than if you do it out of sync. You can do it in kind of any order, but this is the little outline that I outlined in my book, uh, the Restoration Agriculture Process. What we first do is we identify our biome. Where do we live ecologically? What are its keystone species, the plant communities? What are the, the, all of the different plants that live one on top of the other, and which ones have economic value, food value, feed value, uh, fuel value? And let's design our systems after that. Yes, you can grow saguaro cactus in Fairbanks, Alaska, if you want. And yes, you can grow bananas up at 8,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains with proper microclimate management and all that kind of stuff. So what, Permies? If you're not feeding yourself with your place, there's no time for play until you've fed yourself and producing enough surplus food that you can send it off to others. It's called a farm. It's called a business. We earn money at this. Now we can play with bricks and saguaro cactus and fairbanks. <laughs> when, you, when you pick the natural native plant communities around you, we'll substitute um, you know, selected cultivars for the different things. And, and one of my favorite biomes is the oak savanna biome. And the taller species would be the phagaceae, which are oak chests on the beach, understory of cherries and apples, shrub layer of plums and hazelnut, and cane fruit like blackberries and raspberries, Grapes climbing all the whole mess. Gooseberries and currants in the shade. Uh, fungus decaying the whole thing. Does anything sound like it could be food or of economic value in there? And then how about the green grass grows all around, all around, and the cows, and the pigs, and the sheep, and the chickens, and the turkeys? Where were the annual plants? None. We can still use them, and they're actually very, very useful. So once we identify our biome and imitate that, we want to go and manage our, our water. We want to take the water that naturally concentrates in, in the valleys, catch it way up high in the watershed up here, and spread it out towards the ridges with some simple earthworks and just a repatterning of our, uh, of our tillage practices. And just look up the book, uh, Water for Every Farm by P.A. Yeomans. It describes the key line design system. Anybody ever read that book? It's like three hands out here, great. And so very few people read that book, but then all the people who claim to have read it, I bet you hardly anybody's ever made it past page 126. He theoretically spoke English, but I don't know where he learned. <laughs> so we want to manage our water. So we evenly hydrate the landscape. We don't want to drain the landscape. We want it to be evenly hydrated. Then we establish our edible woody polycultures. Once again, I refer to the brush on the side of the road. This over that, over this, over that, over this, over that. The green grass grew all around, all around. The water management pattern tells us where to put our roads, our fences, our utilities, our pipelines. Um, then we transition, we have to cash flow today, so we use the agroforestry practices, and I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the agroforestry practices, and then we just manage it for eternity. 
Um, somebody was asking me earlier, well, gee whiz, permaculture is said it's like no work. You just like sit around and put a helmet on so you don't get hit by the falling food. Like, <laughs> farming's a lot of work, folks. I don't know if you guys have like, done that before. It just is. <laughs> but the kind of work that I do now, it's mostly, it's just harvesting. I'm a glorified hunter-gatherer, except I don't have to go hunt for it, because I know where it is. I don't have to, like, all of a sudden, oh, look, here's the blah, blah, blah bushes. I know exactly where the blah, blah bushes are, because I put them there. <clears throat> all right, so alley cropping is probably the, the easiest transitional practice. If you're a corn farmer right here, for example, plant your trees in a row uh, with, your, with your crop growing in the alley. A few years later, like three years later, you got you know, taller trees with your corn crop on either side, and then nine years later, now it's time to thin. Oh no, that's work. But well, I'll take those trees and cut them down there, and you knock them in little mushroom leaves there, and boom, up in the middle of the woods, you get shiitake mushrooms growing on your logs. Everything that we want to do, we want to have any any uh, time we go out there and make an entry into a field, we're harvesting something. You know, we're either harvesting corn, or we're harvesting mushroom logs, or we're harvesting forage for livestock. We try to make it so that every activity is some sort of yield. Whoop, I pushed the button too fast. This is actually an operation up in Quebec a number of years ago at the International Agroforestry Conference. Uh, these folks attended. They were one of the largest cherry producers in Quebec. And uh, they got excited about this, this alley cropping idea. And so they decided to go ahead and try uh, putting salad greens in between the rows of their new, uh, newly established cherry trees. And lo and behold, they made so much money at it, they said, wow, let's put it in between the rows of some of our other cherry trees. And so at first they started as being one of the largest cherry producers in Quebec. Now they are the largest fresh cut, ready to eat, wash bag, salad mix company in Quebec. They didn't lose yields, they got more yields. We can actually totally increase the yields of our crops. Greg was one of the first grazers that actually, I think, got it when we're talking about all these tree crops. He read in the, the book uh, Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith that the honey locusts, the pods of the honey locusts, just naturally all by themselves, are the equivalent of about 50 bushels an acre of corn. He's like, ding, light shade, gives shade to my animals, they're happier, the grass grows better because it doesn't get cooked in the sun and it makes 50 bushels an acre of corn, that's 100% win. So we start allow honey locusts to grow on his farm. His neighbors think he's crazy because it's these big, huge thorns that like pierce your tires. So you don't lose yields. This is at our farm in southwest Wisconsin. How many guys are produce rats? I've grown produce for 20 years, and I'm so glad to not pick cucumbers anymore. <clears throat> so this is, this is an acre of uh, acorn squash grown between the alleys of uh, hazelnut. Now you think about this. When you first plant the trees in the ground, Mr. Berry over here, you may have two, three years, five, seven years in some cases with no yields at all. So you might as well get your yields out of your alleys in between while your woody plants mature. Uh, once upon a time, I was doing probably 12 acres of produce was my peak um, of, of doing annual produce. And now I only do about two acres of annual produce. I have two acres of asparagus, plus the chestnuts and hazelnuts and apples and the animals and so on. This is asparagus alley crop between chestnut. The alley width here was determined by how big a chestnut tree will be in 30 years when the asparagus will eventually peter out. So the asparagus goes through its life cycle, starts to fade away. It's starting to fade now when we were 20. Um, and then eventually the chestnut trees will close canopy, will grow grass up there, and will graze livestock. So the system is always changing. The grazing of livestock reminds me of one of my other favorite agroforestry techniques, and that's silvo pasture. That's the intentional integration of trees and livestock and forage management. It's not just turning your cows loose in the woods. It's managing the forest canopy to allow for good pasture growth and good uh, livestock grazing. And uh, you'll notice in here there's also mulberries. We use mulberries uh, primarily for pig food, but also the foliage on um, both mulberry and chestnut uh, and black locust is all uh, more nutritious than alfalfa hay. So we do a lot of cut and drop and let the animals eat the uh, foliage off of it. All of the maintenance under here, if you're going to grow black walnut for timber, You'll want to do some, some pruning. You want to remove those side branches. Well, these guys do it for me. Rub, 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 scratch. You'll want to do some weed control underneath. They do it by rip, 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 and tear up the grass. They do all the fertilizing for me as well. I don't need to make that sound. <laughs> and this, this is another, just another silver pasture system, the same herd, going through a light canopy of, of white ash. And these are cowies, and that's the dog. 
just want you to see these pictures. This isn't like weird, strange stuff. It's really relatively simple. Um, we can have 110 acres of prime pasture land on our farm and have 110 acres of woody crops on our farm and have 110 acres of berry crops on our farm and have 5 to 10 to 15 acres of produce on the farm. We just keep stacking the layers on deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Because the kids and the sheep, are, we use the sheep kind of like our uh, U.S. Marine Corps. They go into really nasty territory where there's lots of thorns and brush like that. Whether they win or lose, we, uh, we kill them anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and we follow along with the uh, follow along with the piggies. This kind of shows a good picture as well. How, how there's no there's really no branches in the lower parts of the trees. The cattle are doing a lot of, of browsing down low. It helps to short circuit a lot of the uh, fungal cycles where a water, a water drop will splash on a spore on the ground, and the spore will splash up, catch a leaf, then it will splash again and keep climbing up the whole tree, especially uh, in apple trees. And the cattle will remove those lower branches, doing the thinning and pruning for me, and it also short circuits the, uh, the um, disease cycle. And we keep all the animals in with the thin uh, electric fence. Pigs are very smart. We uh, actually ring the pigs' noses. How many people have rings in your noses? Right. Come on, somebody has to have rings in their noses. What it does is it keeps them, there we go, there's some over here. I bet you she doesn't root in the ground either. That, that's what we, we use that for. If you want pigs to plow, don't put rings in their noses, they'll plow really well. But we want to maintain the pasture at all times because that's, that's the driver. Uh, instead of thinking of myself as a livestock operator, I'm a cow, bro, I'm raised hogs. I'm an ecosystem manager, and the animals are the managers of that ecosystem. I use the animals as tools to do the pest control, the weed control, the fertilizer. Uh, it's not like my enterprise. Whoop. So then you end up with something like this. You end up like Greg uh, mentioned, an oasis in the middle of corn and beans. There's, like I said, 100% grass cover. We got grass everywhere. The animals can graze everywhere, eventually. We also have 100% trees everywhere. Where you see the yellow here, that's oilseed crop. This is uh, sunflowers. It only takes three acres of sunflowers to press enough oil to run our tractor. Um, this is mostly where we do our annual produce here, and these two acres of asparagus there. Well, what good is that if one, one idiot who's crazed goes out and does this on a farm? We need to do this over and over and over all over the place. The planet needs this. The oak savanna is what the Midwest was in, in most places. And if we make one small change, a lot of permaculture to say, say oh, we make small incremental changes to avoid big disasters. That's right, I want to do one small incremental change. I want to turn all of the uh, annual crop land in the Midwest back into the savannah that was before Europeans got here. One small change, okay? <laughs> a small change. If we, make, if we make that one small change, and if we're imitating what nature did before we got here, how bad can we screw up, right? We can. We can't screw up. Now, how we can screw up is with triviality again. And i got to refer back to what um, Roland was saying about a lot of littles make a big. Um, when I first moved to Wisconsin, that's a whole different story of how I got there. In the first place, uh, I joined this little co-op called that's now called the Cooperative Regions of Organic Producer Pools. And uh, it had started with about 65 members that were former tobacco uh, growers that got extra cost share money to all of a sudden start growing organic produce and they'll pool their produce together and sell it you know, in Chicago and Milwaukee and all that kind of stuff. It had been going for about four or five years when I showed up and it dwindled down to 23 people. So I joined and I was grower number 24 and it was in that summer that uh, they, they had done uh, cheese for one year. They contracted out to have somebody because a couple of these guys were dairy men. And they made cheese and they put their own private label on it and they think, wow, what kind of brand name can we put on our cheese? And so as these ideas went around the table, all of us farmers sat around the two picnic tables. This one guy, a friend of mine, uh, a member of our band, Jim Pierce, came up with the word, what if we call it, what if we call it Organic Valley? What a great idea, thought we. And then we figured, well, you know, first of all, when I, when I got there, it was $300,000 in gross sales. And we dreamed of the day when we'd make a million dollars in gross sales. All of our prayers would be answered. Everything would be, you know, swimming. This is a, this is a horrible picture I took it last summer, but this is new. Uh, <laughs> oh, did I tell you I live in Wisconsin? They don't call it the, the frozen tundra for nothing. Like that. So this is this is the um, uh, main distribution center in Cashton, Wisconsin. Uh, this is where all the product 
gets aggregated, put on trucks, and then sent out to where it goes. We, we started, I was grower number 24, we now have 2,400 growers. What we did is we weren't trivial. What we did is we actually produced something. So permaculturists and restoration agriculture folks, let's actually do something for real, for real. Enough of it that it makes a difference. Then let's stick together. You should see our annual meetings. We argue, we fight, we mud wrestle. There's parking lot things going on that I don't even pay attention to. <laughs> then we come back in and we vote. And sometimes it goes your way and sometimes it doesn't go your way. There are things that go on in this organization that I don't really approve of. There are things that go on in this organization I really approve of. And you just, the point is we gotta stick together. Um, the 80% uh, of all people who file IRS Schedule F, farmers, 80% get the majority of the income from off the farm, okay? So nobody's making their money on the farm, so don't sweat it if you're not making all your money on the farm. Then the second thing is, is of all farmers who file IRS Schedule F, it's something like 90% of them make $10,000 or less. 90% of all farmers make less than $10,000. That's not a livelihood, folks. So what if we took your 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, there's a billion dollars in sales in this room. If you would just stick together, pool your resources, and go places with it. It's gonna take you getting along with her. And I know that she's got the evil eye for you already. You don't have to get along with her, you just have to stick together, okay? What was it, what was it Sam Adams who said, we better hang together, because if we don't, we'll surely hang separately, right? <laughs> We've got our own fleet, we have our own oil press. Uh, there's a number of us growers that are growing our own oil seeds, and a dairy farm in Wisconsin only takes 10% of your, of your crop land in oil seeds in order to fuel your farm. And we're not taking food away from people to fuel our vehicles because the oil can be pressed and sent to the potato chip factory where it gets, fries the potato chips, then it comes back, it's filtered and dewatered, and goes back to our trucks and tractors. We're not taking food away from the fuel system. We're actually creating our own fuel system for, for real. And just this last summer, we have our own fuel pump right downtown. You swipe your credit card and shh, homegrown, right in your tank. The whole internal fleet is run on vegetable oil. What happens is when, when all of a sudden you do something real and collaborate with others who do something real and actually stick together, how many different food hubs are going on here in South Carolina? It's one of the hotbeds of the whole food hub activity. What if you guys actually stuck together? You're a player. You're a player, but instead, oh, we're smarter than they are. We've got a better marketing angle than they do. Our software is better than those. And besides, I don't like them. They live over there. They're strangers and foreigners and all that kind of stuff. If you guys just stick together, let's, let's have a, a unified front when we go up against big ag. We are little ag, spelled with a capital B. There's no B in little ag. <laughs> so let's say what happened in the 20 years that I've been part of Organic Valley. We went from $300,000 in sales to last summer we crossed over a billion dollars in sales, right? <laughs> I'm still a little guy. I've got less than five acres of produce. I can be a little guy. I don't make money selling produce. Where I make money is by being a part of a company that's growing that fast. And that's where the real bank is long term, is by being part of an organization that's going places, setting the pace, we have our own propaganda wing, and now when Organic Valley takes a, a, a billion dollars in, right, that counts as, it is, as an asset, then it deposits it in the local bank. The local bank gets to count that billion dollars too. Then it pays it to all the farmers. The farmers get to count that billion dollars. Then the, the farmers go to their local businesses and they get to count the billion dollars. That same billion dollars gets counted over and over and over and over and over again. It's called local economy, for real. This used to be a ghost town downtown. All the empty storefronts of the old, the, the 1950s bygone era. It's now filled with businesses of people who are there. They're either employees of Organic Valley or farmers for Organic Valley or spouses of people in Organic Valley. Uh, we started our own Waldorf schools, youth initiative high schools, there's all these different enterprises going on simply because the growers decided to actually grow something for real. They actually decided to stick together and stick with it through thick and through thin and to actually uh, get the aggregation to scale. Individually, my farm is not to scale. I can't access the big markets. But 
all combined, like I said, if we took all of your farm receipts right now and added them up, there's a billion dollars in sales right here. Let's be a force in the marketplace, for real. that you've ever been to in your life. You know, this other, other collaborative ventures that started up are, this is the Viroqua, Wisconsin food co-op. You could be in like Berkeley, California, or New York City, San Francisco, something like most amazing little food co-op. You know, 90% local, local products being grown. Now, when it comes to restoration agriculture and uh, permaculture farms, there's a new initiative that got started by a bunch of young folks in California that overnight has attracted the attention of uh, big party investors, and they've got markets. Uh, it's like 30% of the United States market is uh, LA to San Diego. I mean, that's like the market. It's not just a niche market, it's like the market. Um, so it had to develop in two wings. First of all, they said, well, we'll start selling these products. So they start buying and selling at first, they started with hazelnuts and chestnuts and acorns, of all things. Well, then they found out that, lo and behold, the demand for those products outstrips the supply. So now we need more supply. So they go around recruiting growers. They find out that there's this wine, the general wine out in the community that, oh, young people want to get into farming, but they just don't have access to land. Well, that's a myth. Land is for sale everywhere. Young people can have access to the land. You just have to figure out how to use your credit wisely and get some land. So now there's this company called Restoration Agriculture Development that buys real estate uh, and uh, does the waterworks management on it, does the edible woody crops establishment, and then brings in young farmers and sells it to the young farmers. And typically they start with like a five year interest only payment period. And so your, your expenses in, in the startup years are uh, minuscule. So this, this company right here, keep an eye on these guys, Restoration Agriculture Development and Restoration Agriculture International. We can revegetate the planet with natural ecosystem mimics uh, in a few short years. This farm in the background, New Forest Farm, only took 20 years. It paid its own, it paid its own way. In 20 years, we can revegetate the entire planet at a profit while feeding people a better diet and more food than they have right now. Fact. Keep an eye on this stuff. Oops, there was supposed to be one more slide. I'm gonna find it. <laughs> Because, there it is. <laughs> These are the people that I love most in the world. We can revegetate the planet in 20 short years at a profit if we actually do it. And if we actually stick together, get off our butts, and put roots in the ground. And why do we do it? Because we love one another, people. I love every single one of you, and I don't even know half of you. What we've got to do is we've got to stick together, we've got to help each other out, encourage one another, pick each other up when we fall, band-aid the boo-boos when we get hurt, because there's nobody else out there here to help us, okay? There's a lot of lip service being done. We have to really create the real abundance of the future now. We have to do this now, and we have to do this out of the power and the strength of our love and our conviction and our support for one another. So let's rock on. <laughs>